It's almost here, isn't it? Christmas is almost here. You're like, almost? We're still in November. Listen, it's only four weeks away. It's crazy, right? Four weeks, Christmas will be here. Seems like just yesterday I was thinking about things in Jan- last January, and, uh, and I can't believe Christmas is almost upon us. It's, it's amazing. You know, Christmas brings about stories, some good, some bad. Hopefully most of your stories are good stories. And, uh, and I know I have some bad stories, but some good stories as well, some Christmas stories that I, I always recount as Christmas comes upon us. And, um, and we all have stories about Christmas, and I want to share a story with you today. I want to share a couple stories with you. Um, when I was young, I, uh, <clears throat> I think I was eight or nine, I, uh, I was anticipating Christmas, and I had been praying and praying, praying, praying some more for a bike. I mean, it was a sweet bike, you know, like neon wheels and stuff. It was, it was a, the, the best bike I think ever existed. And so I prayed and uh, I did as, as many good things as I could. And I, I prayed that the Holy Spirit would fill Santa with, with the Holy Spirit too. And that he would know that I'd been a good boy and that I would get that bike. Well, Christmas morning came and I walked out of our, my bedroom and into the hallway and into the hallway and into the living room where our Christmas tree was. And I looked and I didn't see a bike. Opened up a lot of my presents, went through, you know, this and that, and was excited about some. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, where's the bike? I wanted the bike. I looked to my left about the time I was done with most of my presents, and our dining room room table was was coordinated with our living room. There was no wall of separation, and I saw a red string tied to a chair in the dining room. And I thought, that's kind of strange. What's that string doing there? And my analytical brain got the best of me. Uh, curiosity got the best of me. I went over there. I looked at this string. It was sinking down to the floor, and it ran along the wall and started to follow it and followed it some more. We had a one-level house. It was rather big, though. We had an addition on, so it went through the hall, went through our back living room, and our, our house went kind of in a circle. So it went through the back living room. There was a, a porch area, and then there, there was another area that was the laundry room and where we stored some food, pantry area. There was a bedroom, came back out into the hall. And this time I'm like, somebody's mean. <laughs> Somebody's just leading me on a wild goose chase, right? Still following, comes back out through the living room, through the dining room, through the kitchen, down the steps. And we had transferred our, 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 or transformed our, uh, our garage into uh, my parents' bedroom. And uh, went down into my parents' bedroom, opened the door, lo and behold, the bike. I, uh, I don't think I literally did this, but I, in my mind, I like hit my knees, you know? I'm like, yes, I got the bike I wanted. I was so excited, and I thanked my parents so much, and, and they took credit for it. They didn't say anything about Santa. They just said, we got you that, because they knew how big of a deal it was to me. And that was a good, good Christmas story for me. Well, what about you? What Christmas stories come to mind when, when, when you start hearing the songs, when you start seeing the lights? What stories come to your mind? Are they good? Are they bad? I want to share some stories with you this morning. And they might seem a little odd at first, but just stay with me. And I'm going to have to read them, so, so please just listen intently. If you'll listen intently this morning to the stories, you act as if you're there. Will you say amen? Ah. Come on, if you'll be there, if you'll be intent, if you'll listen intently, would you say amen? That's better. All right, here we go. Story number one, three real life Christmas stories. Now the names of the individuals have been changed, all right? The first one, story number one. The first story is of a young girl named, named Tammy. Tammy grew up in an ungodly home, and so it wasn't a surprise to anyone when she married an ungodly man. It was a surprise, however, when her ungodly husband unexpectedly passed away, leaving Tammy feeling alone and scared. Tammy had always been close to her brother-in-law, but when she slept with him after her husband's passing, it seemed as if it just wasn't right. And when he too died, unexpectedly, it seemed that all heaven and earth were against her. Tammy was distraught. She was confused, but she wanted desperately for someone to love her and give her a family that she could love in return. It was at that point that Tammy began to spiral out of control. And in her desperation and despair, she concocted a plan by which she would try to seduce her own father-in-law. Much to her father-in-law's discredit, Tammy did so successfully. And after sleeping with her own father-in-law, Tammy became pregnant with twins. Tammy's real life story is beyond our imagination. 
Her life was one big mess, complete with an ungodly upbringing, loss of her first husband, death of a second husband, disappointment after disappointment, and sexual immorality, even incest. Tammy's life was not what you and I would call a success by most standards. Story number two. Raven wasn't young, but neither was she old. She had been a little more than promiscuous in her life. In fact, Raven was a prostitute. Life was hard for her, and it didn't help that she lived in a war-torn Middle East. She grew up in a seemingly impossible environment in which women and children were viewed more as property than human life, and her life was no different. Amidst the backdrop of war, Raven soon found herself in a precarious situation, having to choose between the lies of her own people and the neighboring enemy. Raven was used to being propositioned in her field of work, but when the neighboring enemy invited her to aid them in the destruction of her own people, she was faced with the biggest decision of her life. In the interest of self-preservation and the preservation of her family, Raven chose to save her own life and her family's life by helping the enemy conquer and kill her fellow countrymen. By anyone's standard, Raven was looked upon as the scum of society. Simply put, she was a prostitute, a liar, and a traitor who ultimately betrayed her own people. Raven's life was not what you and I would call success by most standards. Story number three. Beth was beautiful, very beautiful, and the kind of woman who knows she's beautiful. Though Beth was married to a wonderful man who loved her very much, she sometimes felt as if he loved his work just a little bit more. Beth was happy on the days her husband was able to spend time with her, but when he would leave for months on end, she would become lonely. Beth lived in a simpler time, a time when neighbors knew each other by name, a time when you didn't have to lock your front door at night, a time when the windows of a home were kept open, no curtains, no shades, just the fresh evening air billowing in unencumbered. It didn't really occur to Beth that someone could be watching her through her window. Even if it did, she seemed like the type of woman who wouldn't necessarily mind. But even Beth never imagined her privacy could be invaded by a peeping Tom. Unaware of the peeping Tom's actions and unaware of his intent, Beth accepted his cordial invitation to his home next door. This may have seemed inappropriate to some, but she reasoned in her mind that she just needed a friend. She just needed someone to talk to, someone who would listen. Her husband was once again away on business, and she began, she began to feel alone again. What could it hurt, she reasoned. As she lay in bed with another man, a million emotions besieged her. Guilt, pain, betrayal. How could she? She truly loved her husband. So how could she have slept with another man? And little did Beth know the worst was yet to come. Her husband would be home soon. How could she tell him she was pregnant with another man's child? Beth's life was not what you and I would call success by most standards. Would you turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 1? As you turn there, we'll go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to bless the message this morning. Father, we thank You for allowing us to come together to worship You. We pray, Lord, that You would speak through Your Word. Lord, we pray that You would simply do what You want to do, what only You can do, in our hearts. I ask, Father, that if there's anybody here that doesn't know you as Savior, that today would be the day of their salvation. They would know they can trust in Jesus Christ and have eternal life because of him. Be with us now. Help us to lift you up. May you get all the glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So we have these three stories, and obviously I don't want you to raise your hand, but can you relate at all? Does anything strike a chord in there? Maybe a story in your life comes up every Christmas that's not necessarily a happy story like my story at the beginning. But how do these stories relate to Christmas? We'll come back to those stories in a moment, but I want to look at Matthew chapter 1. And in Matthew chapter 1, the author is really trying to convey a main point. And when I want to look at this point, and I know it's a little tedious, and I know as Christians, a lot of times what we do is we see a chapter like this, we see verses 1 through 17, and we think, that. <laughs> sound like a frog. We sound like, we seem like we're just uninterested. It's genealogy, right? It's boring. It's dull. It's, uh <laughs> Well, we're going to read it this morning. Woohoo! <laughs> and the people said, oh, okay. Amen. All right, here we go. Matthew chapter one, beginning in verse one. I'm going to go fast. So just stay with me. 
says, the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron and Hezron the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amminadab and Amminadab the father of Nashon and Nashon the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asa. Asa was the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham, Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Amon, and Amon the father of Josiah. Josiah became the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Shetil, and Shetil the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel the father of Abihud, and Abihud the father of Elikim, and Elikim the father of Azor. Azor was the father of Zadok, Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Iliad. Iliad was the father of Eleazar, Eleazar the father of Mathen, and Mathen the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. If you're still awake, say amen. Woo! Can you believe I got through those names? You know how many times, Rick, I practiced those names? <laughs> it was bad. Um, I probably botched a lot of them, but, but genealogy can be fun in its own right sometimes. Um, it's important. And, and Matthew's main point here in Matthew chapter 1 is to establish Jesus' right to be king of Israel. That's the point. It, it's to clearly show that Jesus is the rightful person to inherit the throne of David. Now, you think about this, they didn't have Ancestry.com, right? Anybody ever done Ancestry.com? You know, you just go online, you look up who your ancestors were. They didn't have that. So, so what they did is they kept detailed records of their, their parents, their parents' parents, their parents' 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 parents, and go on and so on and so forth. And so they had these records, and they did this for a, a few reasons. You see, for Jews, tribal identification and the line of descent were all important. These were very important things to the Jewish people. Why was it important? There's a couple of reasons. It was, in or, it was important in order to know where to live. You see, when they came into the promised land, you remember when the Jews crossed over into Canaan and they took the promised land, what happened then? They divided up into, into different, their tribes. And, and according to the tribe is according to where they lived. So they had to know who they were the descendant of in order to know where to live. Make sense? So that's an important reason to know where you are from. A lot of people, a lot of records were destroyed, and so they were kind of displaced. They didn't know where to live. And this is one of the reasons it was very important to know what line you descended from. The second reason is to qualify for priestly function. The Levitical priests had to prove that they were of the tribe of Levi. Therefore, they could know that they could do the, the priestly functions. Another reason was to, in order to transfer and transfer or inherit property required uh, proper knowledge of the family tree. If you wanted to pass things down, they didn't have like, I mean, they did wills, but not like we have today. You had to prove that you were of the line of so-and-so in order to get that property. So there's a lot of practical reasons going on here, right? Still a little dry, still a little boring, but nonetheless, very important, very practical. The number one reason, you know, family, feels like family feud. The number one reason that this is important and, and that lineage and, and historical records and understanding who you came from, the, the number one reason, even if some of them didn't know it at the time, was that the promised Messiah would need to be verifiably traced back to King David since that is the lineage the prophecy foretold. Does that make sense? To understand and to know that the Messiah came from the proper line, you had to know where they came from. There had to be a, 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 an undeniable record that the Messiah came from the line of David because that's what the prophecy foretold, that the Messiah, the Christ, would come from the line of David. The Messiah's royal line began with King David and through the prophet Nathan. 
God promised that it would be David's descendants through whom he would bring the king who would reign over Israel and establish his eternal kingdom. You think of 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 through 16. And Isaiah 9 says, articulates it when it says, of the increase of his government, this is speaking of the Messiah, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. That's interesting, right? How can a king have no end? Only if the king doesn't die. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, there it is. The messianic line would be from David. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even for what? Look at it. Even forever. So the promised Messiah would reign forever. Can a human being reign forever? Only if he's, only if he's the God-man. Only if he's the Messiah, the Christ. So we understand that Matthew's point here, who is Matthew speaking to? He's speaking to Jews. He wants the Jews to know that Jesus is the Christ and he has the lineage to back it up. He wants them to know he is from the line of David. Now listen to this. This is interesting. I'm getting a little nerdy this morning. I'm getting a little knowledgeable, a little technical. We're digging in a little bit, but that's okay. Listen to this. It is both interesting and significant. John MacArthur says this. It is both interesting and significant that since the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, no genealogies exist that can trace the ancestry of any Jew now living. The primary significance of that fact is that for those Jews who still look for the Messiah, for those Jews who still anticipate Messiah, for those Jews still waiting on Messiah, his lineage to David could never be established. Wow, right? I mean, God has a way of working things out and we go to something like Matthew chapter 1 and we look, oh, 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 that's boring. Man, that's part of the rock foundation of your beliefs if you're a Christian. Because we must be able to prove that Jesus is the Christ, that he's from the proper line that the prophecy said the Christ would come from. He had to come from David. And so in AD 70, when the temple's destroyed and all the records are destroyed, no one today can rightfully say, I'm Messiah, I'm Christ, because I can trace my lineage back to David because they can't. They can't get on Ancestry.com and do that. They can't pull out the scroll and show people. And Jesus Christ is the last to verifiably claim the throne of David and therefore He's the last to be able to say He is of the Messianic line. See, Matthew's intent is to validate Jesus' royal claim by showing His legal descent from David through Joseph who was Jesus' legal, though not natural, father. Don't let anybody ever tell you that Joseph was the biological father. He's not. The Bible is very clear that Joseph was just the legal father of David. And so we trace back Joseph's line, and we see that it goes all the way back to David, and therefore Jesus has rightful claim to be Messiah and King. That's Matthew's main point. Matthew's intent is to undeniably prove Jesus' lineage and therefore rightful claim to be Messiah and King. Amen? Man, that's important. (laughs) That's important. You see, I think as a church and as individual believers, we've kind of dumbed ourselves down and just said, well, I just need to know that Jesus, you know, He loves me and He loves you, and if you believe in Him, you'll go to heaven. You know, intelligent people out there have intelligent questions, and we need to be able to take them to Scripture and say, look, (laughs) historically, Jesus is of the line of David, which was prophesied to be the only line to which the Messiah could come. The Bible talks about always being ready to give an answer to those who ask of the hope that lies within us. Can you do that this morning? Now, I'm not saying you have to be perfect in every area and know every single part of the Bible, but it makes you think twice about skipping over things like genealogies, right? It's important. And Matthew's intent here is to show beyond a reasonable doubt to the people that doubted it most, the Jews, that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, promised long ago. Practically, what does this mean for you and for me? It means this Christmas season and beyond. That you and I can be confident that we serve, worship, and follow the rightful King of Kings. He's promised. 
He's come forth. I heard a, a, of a, a story the other day, actually not a story, a real life story. I don't think Anthony will mind me sharing this, uh, of a, a Jewish um, synagogue that they're still in practice today. And they, they, the message was about missing the mark and how if we climb Jacob's ladder, you know, we can, we can ascend, but it seems like we always descend. It seems like we always kind of fall short. And the person said, it seems like we always, as Jews, miss the mark. And that's just, it just shows the blindness of the Jewish people. And my heart goes out to them that they would see that their Messiah is verifiably, he can be verifiably traced back to the lineage of David, that he has met all the requirements. This is one prophecy out of how many thousands that were fulfilled. Jesus is the Christ. He's the promised Messiah. And this Christmas, man, what a motivation to be able to tell somebody, I know who the promised Messiah is And I have proof. Would you like to read it with me? You see, this is history. And as much as they want to debunk this, and as much as they want to say, oh, there's so many inaccuracies, and there's so many different things in the Bible that aren't true, and there's so many things that are contradictions in the Bible, if you actually read it with intellectual honesty and integrity, there are none. And we can look back and see that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. This Christmas season and forever, you and I can be confident that we serve, worship, and follow the rightful King of Kings. That's point number one. But you know, that's not the only major point of Matthew chapter one. It's not. There is more, a more subtle point that we often glaze over when we read these genealogies. And I want you to quickly circle a few names. Everybody got your pen out or a pencil? If you don't want to write in your Bible, I understand that. You guys that are a little scared of doing that, I, I totally understand Matthew chapter 1, verse number 3 says, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Circle the name Tamar. Skip down to verse number 5. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Circle the name Rahab. Then go down to verse number 6. It says, Jesse was the father of David the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba. Some of your versions say the wife of Uriah. Circle Bathsheba or wife of Uriah. Now those three names, some of you guys, some of you intelligent people have figured it out already. Those are the stories I told in the beginning. Those are the stories of of, of people in the Bible who had real stories. Tamar was Tammy, right? If you haven't figured it out by now. Rahab was Raven and Beth was Bathsheba. Now, now I, had, I took some liberality, so don't, don't you know, come down on me, come up to me after service, say, you changed the word of God. No, okay, I'm just giving you some modern day examples of, of what it might feel like to be in those situations at those times. And, and those were the stories. If you remember what had happened in those stories, it's pretty intense stuff. Tamar was a Canaanite daughter of, daughter-in-law of Judah. She's a Canaanite lady. And she gained notoriety in Genesis 38. If you want to go back and read the story, I'll recap it for you really, really quickly. This is what happened to Tamar. Tamar's a Canaanite. They, the Jews weren't supposed to marry uh, outside the Jewish people. They, she, he was married in, she was married into uh, Judah's family, married to Ur, weird name, E-R. So Tamar marries Ur, and the Bible says that Ur was a very evil man, and so God did what? Killed him. Done. Your days are done, Ur. That, that was not intended. I don't know what happened there. Days are done. So God kills Ur. And so in that time and in that atmosphere, what was to be done next was the second in line. The next brother was to take the, the uh, Tamar at the time and, and to impregnate her, to get her pregnant so that the seed could go on for the oldest brother that passed away. Well, he did something that was unthinkable in his time. And he, he went in and slept with Tamar and, and spilled his seed on the ground, the Bible says. And, and the Bible says that God looked on that and said, that's evil. Killed him too. Onan. So, so far, the first husband dies. Tamar's left alone. The second husband goes in. He dies. So we're down to the third uh, possible husband, the third possible candidate. His name was Sheila. It's a girl's name. Don't get it confused. Name was Sheila. Well, by this time, Judah is thinking, I don't want my youngest son to die. For some reason, I don't know if this girl has watched So I Married an Axe Murderer I don't know if she's killing them in their sleep. I don't know what's happening. But the husbands, when they marry Tamar, they're dying off. So Judah says, I don't want my youngest son to die. So guess what, Tamar? Here's what's going to happen. He, he kind of concocts a little plan. He says, listen, this is what's going to happen. You go back to your father, your original father. You stay there for a while. 
when Sheila's grown and when he's old enough to marry, then he'll marry you. Sheila's like, all right, whatever. She goes home. Uh, Tamar goes home. Sheila grows up. Tamar realizes, I haven't been married. I don't think Judah intends to give me his son. So then Tamar creates a plan. Tamar says, you know what I'll do? I'll go. And Judah was headed up to to shear his sheep. His wife had just died. He was about to go up to shear his sheep, so he's traveling. She knew of a temple. She, she took off her widow's garment. She, she veiled her face. She disguised herself, and she went up, and she sat by the road just waiting by the temple for who? For Judah. What was she doing? She was acting like a prostitute. She was acting like a harlot. She thought, you know what? I'll trick him, and she did. He came to her and said, what will it take for me to sleep with you? Not knowing it was his daughter-in-law. And she says, give me your signet ring. Give me your staff. Give me the cord that you have on. Those were all things that personally identified Judah. So he says, all right, I'll give you those. And when I come back later, I'll give you a goat and I'll get my things back. She gives him the things. He goes in and sleeps with her. Tamar becomes pregnant with twins. It's a messed up story, right? It's pretty crazy. That's something like on Days of Our Lives. How many of you guys watch Days of Our Lives? tricked you. No, just checking. I mean, that's pretty weird, right? And so when you hear it, you're like, wait, what? <laughs> What's going on here? So, so Tamar gets pregnant and the story goes on. And what happens is a couple months later, you know, Judah goes back home. They find out Tamar's pregnant. Guess what Judah does? He's a righteous man. He says, let's take her out and burn her. As she's about to get burned, she sends him the stuff, the staff, the ring, and the cord, and she says, listen, you tell me whose these things are, and I'll tell you that that's the father of the twins in my belly. (laughs) What do you think was going through his mind? Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Found out, right? He done found out, Uh uh-huh. Yeah, and so so now they're in this terrible situation, and and what seems to be just just a mess. But where's Tamar in Matthew chapter 1? She's right smack dab in the middle. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. What's the point? The point is that God uses messed up stories to glorify his son. Despite our actions, despite what we do to mess things up, God overcomes. And he brings Tamar, who acted the harlot, into the lineage of Jesus Christ. That's pretty amazing. Now, now the second story we know is of Rahab. You guys know the story of Rahab probably a little bit better than the story of Tamar. Quickly, the story of Rahab is this. She was in Jericho, living there. And the Israelites wanted to conquer Jericho, and so they sent two spies, and the two spies go in. They meet Rahab, the harlot, a prostitute. She is said to have run an inn. And uh, who knows what went on there, but not not a very virtuous woman by any standards. And she accepts the spies in. The spies tell her, listen, we're coming to conquer you guys. You can either help us or not. She decides, I think your God is the real God. I've heard what he's done to other people. He's split the seas and all this stuff. I'll help you out if you promise that when you come back, you don't destroy me and my family. And does he agree? Yeah, they agree. They say, okay. She lies, hides them on the roof, tells them to go out another way, wait three days in the mountains, and and they do all those things. They get away scot-free. Later they come back, and you guys know the the story of the walls of Jericho tumbling tumbling down and all that stuff. So here another instance of uh, another example of God using Rahab the what? Harlot. God using somebody that seems unworthy, somebody that's not in the the normal lineage of the Messiah, somebody that is not a Jew, somebody that is despicable in a lot of people's eyes. She could be considered a liar, a traitor, uh, I mean, against her own people. Uh, They annihilated them. (laughs) And I'm sure she knew people that were killed in her own city that she betrayed. God uses Rahab. He also uses Bathsheba. Verse number six, six, Jesse was the father of David, the king. David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. God used a woman who committed adultery to bring about the Messiah. A human being couldn't write that. A, A human being couldn't come up with this plan. This is a God thing. That he would take these people, just so happens that they're ladies. That's another thing. Most genealogies left out women because women were valued a little bit lower, actually a lot lower than men. And yet here, smack dab in the middle of Matthew chapter 1, we have Tamar, Rahab, Bathsheba, and not even mention Ruth, who was a Gentile. 
God used women who were of low opinion in the world's eyes, women who had royally messed things up to bring about the Messiah. That's amazing. And it should give hope to you and to me this Christmas season. If God can use them, can he not use me? If God can use them to bring about the Christ, the promised Messiah, can he not use you to bring the Messiah glory and honor? Absolutely he can. You see, these women were brought into the messianic line. So what's the point? The first point is obvious. Matthew is showing us the genealogical records to show and to prove that Jesus is from the line of David, therefore a rightful inheritor of the kingdom of Israel. But the second point is a little more practical to you and to me. You see, Matthew wants us to see that Jesus, the king of Israel, is like no other king on earth. Jesus is the king of grace. Ah, oh, so beautiful. Have you ever heard of any other king being referred to as the king of grace? The people God chose to be a part of the Messiah's lineage reveal the wonderful grace of God to provide hope for every sinner. It's not really about your story at all, is it? It's not really about my story. You see, our stories, no, how, no matter how messy, no matter how vile, no matter how much we think we veered off of what God's will is for our life, our story is simply to eliminate, illuminate His story, the King of grace. It's about His story. What is the message we have this Christmas to your friends, to your heart, to people that need it? It's that there's a King of grace and He wants to have a relationship with you. I want to read this short poem and just summarize this and we're done. But I I want you to understand, if you walk away with anything today, walk away with this idea. If you don't know Jesus Christ, the thing I want you to know about him is he is a king and he is a king of grace. That means no matter what you've done in your life, you can have a relationship with God the Father because of the king of grace. He will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He will give you a new life. And this Christmas can be the best Christmas you've ever had by knowing the King of Grace. That's to someone here that maybe doesn't know Christ as Savior. Maybe you're here today and you know that you are a Christian. You have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Shouldn't that motivate us to know that He can do anything He wants with our lives? He can use you. He can use me. He is the King of Grace. Here's the poem I want to share with you. Just meditate on this this morning. Oh, the King of Grace. Oh, the King. Oh, the King of Grace that he does not with justice lay me waste. Instead, upon his back my sin he takes. O the King, the King of grace. O the King, the King of grace, that he should spare me one more breath who gave his life so I could live. O the King, the King of grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being the King of grace. Thank you for your mercy, Lord, and your grace towards us sinners who need you. I pray, Lord, that this Christmas season we would time to reflect on you and who you are. Lord, help us to go to the Word of God to search you out, not for our selfish motives, but to see you, to see the King of Kings, who is rightful line, who is rightful heir, who is rightful King of Israel, and to lift you up in glory. And then, Lord, help us to recognize that you dealt with real people in real ways, and you can use them. Lord, you can use us. You can do amazing things. You can do miraculous things in our lives to bring you glory and bring about good in our lives. Help us to have that attitude this Christmas season. Help us to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, to show others with our lives as well as with our lips that he is the king of kings and he is the king of grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you stand this morning as we worship? Do you sing to him like you know him and that he is the king of grace?